Hi guys, it's Professor Fernandez here, and I'm really excited to talk to you about Harris and Bergeron. It's actually one of my favorite, favorite stories. So um, I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about it. We're going to approach this um, definitely as fiction, definitely as a dystopian story. We're going to talk about kind of the big, bigger picture deal with it. I'm approaching this story a little bit different than it. I may approach other stories or other poems or other pieces that we've read during the semester so far. Um, a, because it's one of my favorite stories. And you will notice that I will say this often in the, in the course because they're all my favorite stories for some reason. But I think there's a lot of things to learn here when we're talking about the rhetorical situation and we're talking about how the rhetorical situation applies to fiction. It's really easy to understand rhetorical situation when we're talking about a nonfiction piece like an essay or even an opinion piece. It's super easy. Um, it's a little bit more difficult for poetry and it's a little bit even more difficult for fiction because we've been taught and told that fiction is for entertainment, right? You tell the story, there are characters, it's to be entertained, to be able to tell a story. Um, sometimes we remember that stories can be lessons as well, like in the case of something like Little Red, Rob, or Little Red Riding Hood. Um, so we understand all that, right? But we really have never been taught or very rarely have been taught how to look at a story, not so much as a collection and series of events that happens to characters and what the lesson from that may be, which is a way of looking at it rhetorically. But also, we've never really looked at how to look at a story, take ourselves out a little bit and look at a story for what it could be saying, um, what it could be arguing about whatever, right? So we're going to take a look at that and we're going to do that with um, Harris and Bergeron. So let me share my screen here so you guys can see. Yay, Harris and Bergeron. So let's get started here. All right, so fact or fiction, Harrison Bergeron and dystopia. This is a dystopian story. Um, I can't, I've tried it one semester to try to teach this as a non-dystopia, but it didn't really work. So dystopia um, is essentially the opposite of utopia. We'll get into that in a minute. So I, I want you to understand what you're going to learn here. We're going to apply the elements of fiction here to this story. So if you haven't read or reviewed the very brief, quick lesson on the elements of fiction, please go ahead and do so. We're going to uh, attempt to try to find an argument. Um, no, we're not going to attempt. I'm going to show you an argument that it's making. And we're going to apply the rhetorical analysis to this particular story. So if you haven't read Harrison Bergeron, go ahead and read Harrison Bergeron. It is in your course. Um, you can Google it or out there. You don't really need a copy of a letter from Birmingham jail for this, but it would be nice to have a copy of letter from Birmingham jail because there are lots of similarities between Harrison Bergeron and Dr. King's piece. And then of course your book in case you want to make notes and paper and pen for additional notes, because I want you to be prepared. So let's look a Feast our eyes upon this particular comic family. The Simpsons have been around forever. Like I was younger than you when I saw them on the Tracy Ullman show. Do not date me. Please do not do that. But what's really cool about the Simpsons is that they are prophets. <laughs> they have at least 17 things more now since I've created this presentation, they have predicted 17 things to ha that have come to be. Example, Lady Gaga at the halftime show. They predicted that, they predicted autocorrect. I believe they predicted smartwatches and the iPad. I have to look up the iPad part, but these smartwatches for sure. They predicted that Disney would buy Fox. 
they predicted three-eyed fish is one of the first things they predicted and lo and behold um, three-eyed fish exist um so we have a lot of things that they're predicting so why i like to start with them and start with the simpsons with the, this particular story is that while it is i am not going to say and i'm not predicting nor am i arguing that the simpsons are a dystopian story um i guess you could argue just some things in springfield just doesn't sit right with me but they're they're not a, a dystopian but dystopian stories and pieces tend to predict aspects of the future um sp specifically if it's speculative fiction speculative fiction which is kind of under the umbrella of sci-fi almost on the other umbrella of uh, dystopian they tend to look and in this way dystopian and and speculative fiction which we'll be reading later on the semester tend to predict the future because they're looking at patterns on how people act and have already reacted to things so they're literally playing the house right so they're saying yeah three-eyed fish is going to happen why right? because we've had contamination for a while and wouldn't you know it of course there's going to be three-eyed fish and there are so they they're predicting things so i'm going to pause here and allow you to pause here because if you have not again read harrison bergeron go do it you're going to be completely lost in this presentation if you have not read it it is kind of a big deal that you read the story that we're going to talk about so this is an opportunity to put pause on the button go read the story and then come back okay so i want to review the rhetorical situation um because it's important, again, the rhetorical situation is the backbone to this class. We use this process with everything that we read. So if you haven't learning, learned, learned, hello, learned it, thinking we're gonna pass it by and you don't need to know it and you just took the quiz just to take the quiz and you're good, ha ha ha, joke's on you. We're gonna be doing this in week five, in week six, in week seven, just like we're gonna be doing it in week 14. Hopefully by week 14, or definitely before week 14, you'll know this hands down. So this is just a reminder of what it is. I'm not gonna read it out to you. I think you can read it yourself. You've learned this, we've talked about it. We've talked about it again. You keep practicing, let's move on. Let's start with writer's purpose here. We're gonna go through the rhetorical, parts of the rhetorical situation for this story rather quickly. This story was written by Kurt Vonnegut, who is hilarious or was hilarious. He has actually passed on. He's passed on a couple of years uh, ago now. And he, I would call him like the connoisseur of absurdity. Um, because he just is, and I just enjoy everything, not everything, but lots of things that he's written. He grew up rich and poor. So his dad was an architect, dot, 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 wait for it, during the depression. So <laughs> a, what is a white collar job? have no job because no one has a job during the depression so he very much knew what it was like to have money or to be okay to be middle class and then to be poor so you understand that that's kind of where it's coming from right so he of course is a veteran served in world war ii he was captured by the germans so he was a pow um and then uh later forced into labor in dresden so we have that there in one of his most popular works, Slaughterhouse-Five. You see this influence in his piece. See how we're doing writer's purpose here, how a writer's life kind of influences the work. That's, what's, that's why we go to the writer, right? Um, I consider him a super writer. All the novels, all the short stories, 
works of nonfiction. If you Google him in YouTube, there's actually, he has a couple of videos on the structure of a story, which are really good. He's kind of hilarious. Um, he's kind of hilarious. So I would definitely watch that video. He is, and that I'm getting this quote here from Bloom's literature. Of course, I like to look things up um, in Bloom's literature, and this is actually part of your databases. So if you want to go and do any writer's purpose on any author, and any background on any author, hint, hint, yeah, you can Google it. But Bloom's literature is chef's kiss really good so this quote i took um from bloom's literature and it says vonnegut was widely considered one of the foremost late 20th century american writers using intriguing blendings of black humor science fiction fantasy the comic strip and recurring characters like kilmore kilmore kilgore trout a sense of fatalism and zen inspired phrases like so it goes Vonnegut wrote an ordinary wrote of ordinary individuals caught up in a complicated, greedy, materialistic, and often absurd absurd world. Occasionally, they connect and recognize their shared humanity. And so, this is why we go to Bloom's literature right here. This is really good writer's purpose here because not only do we have someone talking about his work and talking about what he kind of leans to, right? Black humor, science fiction, all that, right? But we also have someone of record, someone who is an academic who studies him literally saying that like, yeah, his stories are about this. They, they, they talk about complicated things that talk about greed materialistic things and abs the absurdity of the world so we know oh let me go back so we know that when we talk about Kurt Vonnegut in the writer's purpose we know that this is what we can expect this is kind of what he does so then the twist here is that we're done <laughs> we're done with writer's purpose and that we understand that this is kind of his thing and so when we approach Harrison Bergeron after we've read it and then we're doing the rhetorical situation and we're starting with writer's purpose now we're starting to understand a little bit of kind of the gumption here for the writer so we under also understand a little bit about um utopia so Harrison Bergeron deals with a uto utopic society which means that everything's great and wonderful and nothing ever goes wrong right you're going to be asked to look up utopia here in one of the activities i believe so he creates this world where nothing is wrong um but it misfires and it creates bigger problems than it was trying to solve which is kind of what dystopia does right um so we know a little bit about this piece um and this goes a goes into um goes into audience here a little bit but we're going to talk about it under writer's purpose that this particular story was published originally in 1961 Ooh, sorry in 1961 um from the magazine of fantasy and science fiction and so we know since we know that to be true we, that leads us a little bit into audience so again utopia here just a big deal this utopia dystopia dystopia is what happens when utopia goes wrong <laughs> right and you've already kind of dealt with the idea of a utopia gone wrong or the dark side of utopia which is dystopia here b for vendetta does this a lot it's that's the whole movie um if you ever seen the handmaid's tale or read the handmaid's tale um watched it season one through f three four i think that we're on um you see kind of like the creation of gilead and why it needed to be created and how this form this dystopia is there and why it was created the maze runner is a thing the hunger games the book and the movie yes people don't like the movie people don't like the book people don't like the book and the movie however example of dystopia dystopian work don't at me 
Okay, moving on. So we're we're done with writer's purpose, right? So we've learned a lot of things about the writer and we learned where the piece originally ran. And let me urge you that when you are doing audience under the writers under sorry, under the rhetorical situation that you look at audience and don't predict who would have read or who would have liked or who the writer was talking to. Don't do that. Why? Because everything was literally published somewhere else and where it was published will give us the audience. So there's no need to do anything other than look at where the thing originally ran and then who is the audience for that magazine. So we know that this was written and public well this was published in a magazine of fantasy and science fiction so we know sci-fi fans and fantasy fans they read this they're about this um those particular fans um some of those not all of them tend to like political statements in their sci-fi and we know that um around that time and this is a little bit into context but around that time april 1963 is when letter from birmingham jail was written and so why i have that there is that it gives us a little bit about what's going on with the audience at that time again it goes into context a little bit so i'm going to save that for context but i wanted to just drop that dime in there so let's talk about the topic here and the topic of this first of all topic in the rhetorical situation like there's always more than one topic don't just say there's one topic and move on and then you're done there are lots of topics these stories these poems these essays hit tons of topics and so the first thing you're going to say is that this is about equality and being equal because beginning opening paragraphs talk about talks about how everyone's equal after all this time right but does it really talk about equality i mean the word is in the story but there's about there's um thoughts about leadership how uh diana glompers the handicapped general leads and what leadership means um the idea of the chosen one there is this one this one extraordinary 14 year old kid right and he is just taller bigger faster stronger more beautiful than anyone else is and thus all the handicaps have to be placed upon him right so the idea of the chosen one is there parents who don't remember so i mean depending on how you look at it you can talk about um parental rights, loss of parental rights, bad parents. Um, you can talk about society. Everything's about society, really, if you think about it. But you can talk about society and societal, societal norms um, and the giving up of maybe freedoms um, and freedoms for the greater good. So what do we need to give up as individuals for the greater good? So those are topics, some topics right, that are in Harris and Bergeron. There's a lot more. I'm not going to give you everything, but there are definitely a lot more. So um, let's talk context. See how we just moved on? We're on already the fourth step of the writer's purpose. Yes, we're going really quickly, but I've done this for a while, so obviously I can go through it quickly. However, I'm not expecting you to go this quick with your rhetorical situation process it's going to take some time right you just have to work at it so the context here the context um like i said earlier is the 60s this was published in the late in the early 60s so he probably wrote it in the early 60s i wouldn't doubt it if somebody found out that he wrote it in the late 50s so there was a lot of things going on in the in the late 50s early or late to late 50s to late 60s you have the civil rights movement which is huge um our version of it is the black uh, black lives matter movement um the anti-racism movement so it's similar but different you have to think no one had twitter no one has social media no one had youtube 
Um, so all these things were happening and, the, and you would get a glimpse of what was happening at six o'clock on the news or maybe on the radio, right? So you have this huge movement happening that um, is gaining traction without the use of TikTok or Twitter, right? So think about that. So in here we have Rosa Parks. Of course, you know the story of Rosa Parks. Emmett Till is very important because we're going to talk about Emmett Till here in a minute. Um, Brown versus Board of Education, which allows, really allows me to be your teacher, frankly, um, and allows probably your best friend to be able to sit next to you in class. So um, that was amazing. I love Brown versus Board. Um, and then the, Chica the Chicano movement also happening during this time. So there was a civil rights movement and then there was a, a Chicano movement happening alongside that happened, I want to say like, mid 60s really when it was gearing up um i'm pretty sure that historians who see this on youtube are going to correct me and i welcome those corrections um so around that time they're almost running in parallel here and there you go that is what's happening that is the context of this story so that's what's happening around the time that this is being being published right lots of things are going on so you can almost see kind of how it's going, how it's coming together, right? From the writer's purpose all the way through context. And you're starting to see themes develop. That's how we do the rhetorical situation. So let's talk about strategy. And the strategy is the elements of fiction. You probably are, um, have, in, have seen, hopefully by now, the quick lesson on the elements of fiction. If you have not seen the quick lesson on the elements of fiction, stop right now. Go watch that because I'm going to fly through this. I'm not really going to explain much because you should already have, you should have already seen that video. So here's your five elements of fiction, plot, character, setting, point of view, and theme. And so I'm going to start with plot first. I know in the, in the other video, I started off with character first. Um, I'm going to start with plot. Um, so plot essentially the thing how things happen in the and the order of which they happen um i think we talked about the a b c d e that the book talks about the action background um development climax and ending kind of where all that is um it's routinely called Aristotle's Poetics. You can Google that if you want, but really it's the triangle, right? We've all been taught the triangle. There's a beginning, there's like some background, it develops, and then there's a complication and it keeps going and another complication, they solve it, but it moves them up and another complication and it moves them up until you hit the climax, the really tip top of the hill. And then you have a quick resolution and an ending, right? So there you spend more time getting up the hill than going down the hill, right? In Harrison Burr's run, it all starts with the parents and we don't get to Harrison until the end, really. We don't know Harrison really with his voice or really much of his action. We know Harrison through his parents who don't remember him or his mom who doesn't remember him. And we get to know him based on the society that has been put in place. Um, that is not because of him, but because he is a threat of, to the society that has been created. Right. So we get a glimpse of this societal norm and this dystopian world, which they think is utopian. Um, through their eyes so we don't even get to see it through Harrison's eyes and so the character here is who's in the story who's primary who's secondary primary primary characters tend to have like the most screen time they, they're in the story longest sometimes they're telling the story not often um, they're usually the main folks and secondary s secondary characters tend to be uh, they only pop up when they need to pop up. They tend to be a metaphor. They tend to be a plot device sometimes. Badly written plot devices I have seen, but sometimes well-written plot devices. They just do their thing and then they're out. They chunk deuce, right? So here's a question I have for you. 
is Harrison Bergeron, the character of Harrison Bergeron, is he a primary or secondary character? True that the story is named after him, but we don't see him till the end. I'll let you debate that among yourselves. I'm moving on. Okay, setting. The when and where the story happened. So we know this happens in the future. Um, that's the when, the where most of this is in front of the television with the parents. Um, and then we, then we kind of zoom in to what's happening on the stage with the handicapped general versus Harris and Bergeron, right? So with setting, you want to know where and when, and you want to know what the rules of this, of the world are. So kind of like um, the world, the, the world building of it. So what are the rules of this world? Well, you can't take off your handicaps. We know this. Why? Because George wanted to take off his handicaps and, or his wife wanted him to take off his handicaps. He said, no, uh, you know, they will know right? So we see the rules of the world. We know that in order for equality to happen, people had, some people had to wear bags over their heads because they're too pretty. Um, we, we know that you can't be too much of something. You have to be pretty average. And to make everybody either go up to average or go down to average, certain things had to be in place. So we know the rules of the game here. One thing that we want to ask, especially with something like Harrison Bergeron, is why would the author set something in the future? This is 1961, guys. Like, you know, the civil rights movement is like, er, where? Is on TV, is outside, people be talking. So why would Kurt Vonnegut put this story in the future and not in his present day? Ah, I will leave you to your deductions. I'm moving on. Point of view. Who's telling the stories, the story, and whose eyes are we seeing this through? Are we seeing this through the eyes of a character? Are we seeing this through the eyes of a third person who's not in the story? Um, are they telling us what's going on like they're kind of like reporting it? It feels some, something like they're reporting. Um, or is it a third person omniscient, which means that they're actually telling us what's going on, but also telling us how people feel and what they think. They may give us a little background. They're like everywhere. Omniscient is godlike, right? So that means that they could talk about little Sally as a character, talk about why little Sally decided to kick little Matthew um, and kind of give like the inside thing. And then even say, and later on when Sally and Matthew got married, they will recall how they met when Sally kicked Matthew for putting glue in her hair, right? So it's something that a third person omniscient narrator would say, and that's what point of view is. Oh, let me go back here. And so, even though, again, it's, it's, it's told through Harrison Bergeron, um, or it's called Harrison Bergeron, but it's told through the parents' point of view. We're seeing things through their eyes, yet the narrator's third person. So it's a th this is a third-person narrator story. Um, but why? Why not tell it through Harrison's eyes and have him narrate his story? What does the writer, what is the writer trying to say by making these decisions? So we've, I've asked a couple of big questions here. We've asked about questions about um, point of view, as far as why would the author choose this point of view? Um, why would, we talked about setting, why would this, why would the author choose to have the setting at the in the future. Um, we talked about character. Why, um, why does Harrison come out at the end and not at the beginning, right? So these are all choices that the writer makes. And these choices are how the writer is creating an argument. Write that down. That's a good thing. Write it down. It may be on a quiz. Maybe. I don't know. I don't remember. It's been a while. Next. 
All right. So when we're looking at theme, theme is taught to us a certain way. Man versus world, man versus nature, nature versus nurture, or nurture versus nature, um, in that way. And I am not saying that is not correct. What I am saying is when we're looking at rhetorical situation, we're looking at theme as argument. Theme is another word for argument, right? So theme is a one-sentence argument and the sentence is debatable. So if we're if we're if I wanted to relate it to something you've already learned, elements of argument, claim, right? Because remember, ele in elements of argument, you have the issue and the issue is a question, and the claim is something that they are claiming is is correct, right? So it is comparable to claim. It is not claim. I don't want to see the word claim in your papers or in your journals when we're talking about fiction. So please do not do that. Please do not do that. Please do not do that. What I'm saying is this is comparable to claim in our elements of argument. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's also not specific to the story. So you're not really mentioning Harrison. You're not really mentioning uh, the handicap handicapper general. You're not mentioning them by name. It's generalized enough that it could fit other situations, but not too general that like no one knows what you're talking about. And so here's a couple of examples here. Um, a really good one may be truth. True equality comes with a cost. Could be a possible argument here for Harrison Bergeron. Another one is there is no such thing as equality unless we all give up our rights, including what makes us special. That's an interesting um, argument. It's a little long. Arguments tend to be about five to seven words, so you have to choose your words wisely, right? Um, there's another one. Total peace in a society means giving up basic human rights for the good of all. And that's another possible theme slash argument for this particular story. So, yeah, fun stuff. And so we return back. Just want to make sure I'm, I'm aware I'm going to be. We return back to the Simpsons and how they have predicted things. And just like how the Simpsons have predicted things, Harrison Bergeron has also predicted things as well. We literally have a story of a 14 year old or a young boy who is seen as a man. He is like tall and very manly <laughs> and like he is a threat. He is a threat to people's way of life or people's existence. And so in a way, he has predicted Emmett uh, or he has predicted Tamir Rice. And this is where I come back to Emmett Till. Emmett Till happened in the 50s. And it actually, it kick-started the, well, some historians will argue that it kick-started the civil rights movement. And so during his time, he has heard about Emmett Till, a young boy who reportedly, allegedly, whistled at a at a white woman in the South. He was from Chicago. He came to visit um, his family in the South. He allegedly was a, at a white woman. Um, he was subsequently kidnapped, lynched, and tortured, and his body thrown in the river. Um, and so he was seen in that instance as not as a young boy, but as a threat. Um, same for Tamir Rice, who was shot by police after responding to a 911 call that a man was wielding a gun and pointing it at people at a nearby park. So that um, he kind of saw the writing on the wall like Emmett Till could happen again in, in a way it has. Um, and so we see a couple of things. We see school shootings happening um, and almost in front of our eyes because we do have social media and so when things happen people take out their cell phones and they turn on their cameras and they stream it live or they upload it later and so we're seeing things almost that they as they happen um, without much processing so for example at the time of, of this created it's been more 
Um, it's been more, but 239 school shootings have happened since Sandra Book, Sandy Hook, sorry. Um, so we see also the idea of sharing people being killed, um, especially when things happen, um, which spirit, when things happen to people of color, um, particularly black people, which spearheaded our movement now, Black Lives Matter. Um, and so we have violence on TV or violence where we all can see it, the computers and TVs in our pockets or purses. So he kind of predicted that as well with George and um, Hazel, I, try, I was trying to remember her name, um, Harrison's mother watching the massacre of their, their only son, right? And her being sad and not remembering why she was sad and almost being desensitized to it in a way that is kind of sinister, right? So that's the deal. That's the spiel here. So you can see how there's ties from 1950s, 1960s, where this was written, how he has, how the writer's purpose has been discussed and how that is even kind of relevant, even in Harrison Bergeron, how we've gone through the rhetorical situation, how we went from writer's purpose to strategy, how we took time with the strategy to look at the elements of fiction and how we eventually came up with da, 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 possible argument statements. So you, we have learned a lot today um, with this video. So I'm hoping that this kind of sheds some light here on some things, um, on how an argument can be made in fiction um, and how sometimes that argument is still being made in the world today. Um, Harrison Bergeron is as relevant today as it was in 1961. Um, just like The Simpsons. Is, well, I don't know, I haven't seen it lately, but relatively relative to what it is today. They continue to be somewhat relative. I'll, I'll say that. I haven't seen it, so I can't say it. Yes, indeed, they're irrelevant, but let me know. Um, so I hope that was helpful for you guys. Uh, let me stop sharing here. So I hope that was helpful and you learned a little bit more of the process, a little bit more of how to put it all together. I will see you guys online. Bye.